The countries of the global south, that is, the countries that were formerly colonized by the Western powers and which represent the vast majority of the global population, are in an open rebellion against an international financial system that they say is completely unjust, unfair, and neo-colonial. An international financial system which is still dominated by the Western powers that built their economies on colonialism and exploitation. We can see this rebellion in many different regions of the world. In West Africa, there's been a lot of attention to the uprisings against French neo-colonialism in countries like Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali, protesting the fact that France still controls the monetary policy of these countries, imposing the currency that they use on these countries that were previously formal French colonies. In Latin America, many governments are saying the same, condemning the Monroe Doctrine, the 200-year-old colonial policy of the United States, and telling Washington, we are not your backyard. We are independent, sovereign states. And this September, the countries of the Global South got together in Cuba for a meeting of the Group of 77, the G77, plus China, and these countries, which represent over 80% of the world population, released a joint statement saying that the international financial system is unfair. We need to completely transform these institutions so the formerly colonized countries can have equal representation, so they can have a voice on the international stage. They called for the democratization of institutions like the United Nations, which are still dominated by the Western colonial powers. And they also condemned the technological monopolies that Western countries have and say that technology and science need to be shared with humanity so together, humanity in solidarity can collaborate to overcome problems like poverty and inequality and climate change and environmental degradation and public health crises. These are all problems that have only been exacerbated by the existing neo-colonial institutions in the world. Now, this all might be surprising for you to hear. I think this is a very important historic meeting that was held this September in Cuba of once again, countries that represent 80% of the world population. And yet there was very little coverage of this summit of the G77 plus China that was held in Habana. And why is that? Well, instead, Western media outlets were focused on the meeting of the G20, which happened a week before in India. And this, the G20, the group of 20, are 20 powerful countries, but this is an organization that was created by the Western powers. It was US and European officials who decided which countries would be invited to join the G20 when it was created in 1999. And in their summit in India, the United States and EU officials tried to pressure other countries that participated to condemn Russia over the war in Ukraine. They failed in that statement, but they tried. And in protest of the Western domination of the G20, the presidents of China and Russia, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, boycotted the summit. They did not attend the G20 summit in India. The United States portrayed this as a diplomatic victory and used the media to take a, a victory lap, claiming that the U.S. is back on the international stage and the West is leading the world. But what really this showed is that China and Russia we're saying that the G20, the Western powers, have essentially killed it by trying to turn it into a platform for their own geopolitical ambitions. And the future of the world is not in the G20, which is just a group of the countries that the West chose to be its friends, but rather the future is in the G77. And by the way, I should point out that the organization is called the G77, but actually today there are 134 countries that are members, which represent 80% of the world population. The reason it's called the G77 is because the organization was formed in 1964 by 77 countries that were part of the non-aligned movement. These were countries that had been colonies and they were rebelling 
against Western colonialism. And of course, the 1960s was the peak of the national liberation movements, the anti-colonial movements across the global south. So the G77 was their organization that they created in order to represent their voice, the voice of the formerly colonized countries on the international stage. And in fact, the G7, which was created by the colonial powers, was founded in the 1970s, a decade later, as a response to the anti-colonial movement led by the G77. So the G7 is essentially, it has always represented the colonial powers, the United States, the European countries, and Japan. These are the colonial countries that develop their economies through colonial exploitation and subjugation and theft of natural resources around the world. So the G7 was the colonial response to the anti-colonial G77, and still today, there are only seven members of the G7. Although in the 1990s, after the overthrow of the Soviet Union, Russia was allowed to join the G7. It briefly became the G8, but then in 2014, after the US-sponsored coup overthrow Ukraine's democratically elected government, and installed a pro-Western regime which pledged to join NATO. This set off the civil war in Ukraine. And in response, Russia was kicked out of the G8 in 2014, and it went back to being the G7. So it is not exaggeration at all to say that the G7 represents the colonial powers and the G77 represents the countries that were formerly colonized, which today, has 134 members, once again, making up 80% of the world population. That's why this summit that was held in Cuba on the 15th and 16th of September this year, 2023, that's why that summit is so important. But of course, it didn't get much coverage in the Western media. And at this summit, the G77 plus China signed a joint declaration I wanna go through and look at some of the main points of this declaration because you can see that across the global south, there is really a kind of unanimous agreement that the, the international financial system is unfair, it's biased against their interests, and it needs to be fundamentally changed. Now, this conference this year, which was organized by Cuba, prioritized in particular the issue of science, technology, and innovation. And the joint statement emphasizes that the existing scientific and technological order, the way it's linked to global capitalism in global economy, it gives Western countries massive monopolies and control over this transformative technology that has the potential to be used for the good of humanity, but instead it's only used to benefit transnational corporations. So a small handful of corporate oligarchs, these elites in Western countries can get rich and the rest of humanity does not benefit from this technology. So I'm gonna look at some of the main points here. The joint statement, again, this was signed by all of the countries represented at the G77 plus China summit. And by the way, a quick note, I should point out that the reason it's called the G77 plus China summit is because China was not among the founding members of the G77 in 1964, but China has long supported the organization and participated in its summits and its declarations. And in that sense, it's actually very similar to OPEC plus, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. For instance, Russia and Mexico are not members of OPEC, but they often participate in OPEC meetings so it's referred to as OPEC plus. So that's why it's called G77 plus China. And in their joint statement, they condemned the quote, current unfair international economic order for developing countries. And it noted that due to this unequal, unfair international system, countries in the global South suffered disproportionately from the pandemic, from geopolitical tensions, from unilateral coercive measures, which are sanctions. And this issue of sanctions was repeatedly mentioned in the joint statement and in the speeches by other leaders. They all condemned the fact that the Western powers have illegally imposed sanctions on countries that represent more than one quarter of the world population.
The joint statement also pointed out that the unfair international economic order has fueled a series of economic and financial crises, increased pressure on food and energy, displacement of people, market volatility, inflation, now with monetary tightening being carried out by the U.S. Federal Reserve and other Western central banks, the growing burden of external debt, the increase in extreme poverty, rising inequalities within and among countries, adverse effects of climate change, biodiversity loss, desertification, sand, dust storms, environmental degradation, and digital divides. So once again, the countries of the West dominate a lot of technology and do not share that technology with the countries of the global South. They also note that this unfair international financial system led to a extreme death and suffering, socioeconomic disruption during the pandemic, which has further exacerbated the stark inequities within and among countries and regions with a disproportionate impact on developing countries. They called, they stressed the urgent need for a comprehensive reform of the international financial architecture and a more inclusive and coordinated approach to global financial governance with greater emphasis on cooperation among countries, including through increasing the representation of developing countries in global decision and policy making bodies. Now, when they say that, that's a clear reference to the United Nations. And in multiple speeches by leaders at the G77 plus China summit, they called for the democratization of the UN. Now, the United Nations was also represented at the summit, and the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, gave a speech. Guterres is a Portuguese politician, and he has been frequently accused of Global South countries of being biased in the interests of the West. And Guterres, clearly acknowledging this criticism, he insisted in his speech that the United Nations supports the voice of the Global South and wants them to be represented on the international stage. But I think we should actually be skeptical of this narrative. And we saw many leaders at the G77 plus China summit criticize the undemocratic structure of the United Nations. Now, they're not calling for replacing the United Nations. They want the democratization of the UN. That's the language they use, democratization of the UN. And they, for instance, have condemned the fact that the decision-making power in the United Nations is not in the General Assembly. It's in the Security Council. But the problem is that the Security Council has five permanent members which have permanent veto power, that's where all of the teeth of the organization really are. The power of the UN is located. And what are those five permanent members? Well, they're the victors of World War II. So that does include, you know, one, very big countries like China and Russia and the United States, but it also ridiculously includes Britain, the, the UK, and France. These are countries that are, at this point, relatively minor powers. They have fewer than 70 million people for their populations. Meanwhile, countries that have some of the largest populations on earth, like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Indonesia, Brazil, these are countries with hundreds of millions of people, or in the case of India, 1.4 billion people, and they don't have permanent seats on the UN Security Council. So this is absurd, and it shows that the United Nations still is very biased in the interests of the Western colonial powers. It needs to be fundamentally transformed and democratized. And this is a point that many leaders at the G77 plus China summit in Cuba emphasized in their speeches. Now, continuing in the statement, the G77 plus China called for the pursuit of global development and win-win cooperation. This is a concept that China has promoted a lot and it has a lot of support in the Global South. Win-win cooperation, as opposed to the dog-eat-dog -dog competition, the zero-sum game mentality that is, that is proposed by the Western capitalist countries. And the joint statement also notes, once again, that the countries reject the imposition of laws and regulations with extraterritorial impact, and all other forms of coercive economic measures 
including unilateral sanctions against developing countries, and reiterate the urgent need to eliminate them immediately. So once again, they are emphasizing, these countries representing 80% of the world population, that the sanctions that the Western powers have imposed on one quarter of the world population, on countries that represent nearly one third of world GDP, those are illegal sanctions. They are completely illegitimate. And according to international law, they need to be lifted immediately. This is not a matter of opinion. This is according to international law. This is a crime. The joint statement emphasized that these sanctions, these unilateral course of measures, have negative and devastating impacts on the realization of human rights, including the right to development and the right to food. And furthermore, the joint statement condemns the technological monopolies and other unfair practices that hinder the technological development of developing countries. And they also talked a lot about the issue of intellectual property right and how Western governments and corporations exploit this to prevent poor countries in the global south from getting access to the technology that they need to industrialize, to develop their economies, and to not be simply dependent. Because this is the goal of the Western imperial powers, is to trap countries in the global south, to make them economically dependent on the Western economies in the global north, to maintain this kind of neo-colonial relationship so the countries of the south the formerly colonized countries cannot have true economic sovereignty. And related to that, another important part of the joint statement from the summit emphasized the need to challenge brain drain of specialized human resources trained in the countries of the South. So what essentially happens is that Global South countries, they invest all of these resources in training scientists and engineers and doctors and in technical experts in different fields that they need. But then the global north countries, the United States and other Western countries, they encourage those highly trained professionals in the global south to immigrate to the north because they know that they can get paid slightly higher wages. But also the countries in the global north know that they can actually pay those global south trained specialists lower wages. So it's a way of the global north countries to try to keep wages low to prevent technical experts in their countries from, from having higher wages. So it's a way of draining the skilled labor from the global south after countries have invested all these resources in training them. And that, of course, hinders the economies of the south and makes it harder for those countries to develop economically. But it's also a way for the countries in the north to try to bring wages down once again. So the only ones who benefit are the corporate elites that are profiting from this process, from exploiting labor in the North and in the South and preventing the South from being able to industrialize and develop its own technological expertise. Now, I also want to look at some of the highlights of the speech given by the host of this summit, which was Cuba and its president, Miguel Diaz-Canel. And he gave a very interesting, very powerful speech. And this is according to the official transcript on the website of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cuba. And Diaz-Canel said, Cuba is literally besieged by a six decade blockade and beset by all of the problems that go with that siege, which has recently been intensified. This is a very important point because Cuba has been suffering under an illegal US blockade for more than 60 years. And every single year at the United Nations, in the General Assembly, basically every single country on earth votes against this illegal U.S. blockade. The only country that joins the U.S. in voting in support of the U.S. blockade of Cuba is Israel, the Israeli apartheid regime, every single year. But some people say, well, you know, under Barack Obama, some of the U.S. sanctions on Cuba were lifted, although the blockade was not ended. And again, only a few sanctions were lifted. But then when Donald Trump came in, he expanded the sanctions even further. Under Trump, the U.S. government imposed hundreds more sanctions on Cuba, trying to suffocate the Cuban economy and the Cuban people. And then when Joe Biden came in, a Democrat, 
you know, Biden rightfully criticizes Trump in a lot of ways, but he actually continues many of Trump's policies. And Cuba is an example of this. Not only has Biden refused to lift the hundreds of new sanctions that Trump imposed on Cuba, he has continued imposing more sanctions. So this is completely a bipartisan policy in the United States. It's completely sadistic and it's illegal. It's criminal according to international law. So in his speech, the Cuban president went on and pointed out that in addition to the sanctions and blockade, the countries of the South are facing immense challenges generated by the prevailing unjust international order. He notes that for reasons of history and identity, the G77 has kept the original name, even though today it represents 134 countries, which represent more than two thirds of UN member states and 80% of the world population. He reiterated the call to democratize the UN. And this is again, the point I mentioned earlier about how it's ridiculous that Western powers dominate the Security Council and that, you know, Britain and France have permanent seats and not, you know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Brazil, Indonesia, countries that have populations that are many times larger. Diaz Canel pointed out that the summit is taking t place at a time in the year 2023 when mankind has achieved a level of scientific and technological process unimaginable a couple of decades ago, conferring an incredible capacity for generating wealth and well being, which, in terms of greater equality, equity, and justice, could ensure decent, comfortable, and sustainable living standards for practically every inhabitant of the planet. But that's not actually what's happening at all. Instead, the, the new technologies created have only exacerbated the inequality. And, and Diaz-Canel says that the North has adapted the world to suit its interests at everyone else's expense. The moment has arrived for the South to change the rules of the game. I think this is a very important point. He's saying that the South needs to change the rules of the game. I think this is likely a reference to the United States use of the term, the so-called rules-based international order, because Washington and also its allies in Brussels have been trying to replace international law with the so-called rules-based international order in which the West makes the rules and orders everyone around. But those rules, once again, even when they are defined, they're almost never defined, they're left intentionally very ambiguous and vague, but even when they are defined, these are rules that were created by the Western colonial powers in their interests. So here Cuba is saying that the South needs to change the rules of the game and make this system actually fair for everyone. Now, he notes that the South, the Southern countries have been the primary victims of the world's multidimensional crises, including the cyclical imbalances in international trade and finance, the abusive unequal exchange, and his use of the term unequal exchange. That specific term is very important because here is Cuba acknowledging the work of world systems theorists, anti-imperialist political economists like Samir Amin, Argiri Emanuel, Emanuel Wallerstein, acknowledging how the capitalist world system is designed in a way that systematically drains the wealth from the periphery, largely the countries in the global south, the formerly colonized countries, that wealth is drained by the global north. The wealth is sucked out of the south and sent to the north to the colonizing countries. And unequal exchange describes the process through that which that works in a neo-colonial way. The capitalist countries of the core of the world system, largely in the north, the rich developed imperialist countries, they don't necessarily need to formally hold the territory and militarily occupy the territory of the former colonies in order to continue to drain that wealth. Instead, it's done through unequal trade, unbalanced trade, through the Western domination of certain industries and countries of the South relying solely on exporting low value added commodities and raw materials, the super exploitation of labor of workers in the South and the attempt to depress their wages 
And all of these factors play in to unequal exchange, which is, again, when, when he's saying that term, that's it, a very specific reference. Diaz-Canel also said that the Global South has been the victim of the science, technology, and knowledge gap, the danger stemming from progressive destruction and exhaustion of the natural resources on which life on Earth depends. We demand realization now of the overdue democratization of the system of international relations. So once again, we see this refrain that is repeated a lot in many of the speeches. The international system needs to be democratized. It is undemocratic. It is authoritarian, acting on behalf of the colonial powers. The Cuban president added that it is the countries of the South which suffer most from poverty, hunger, indigence, deaths from curable diseases, illiteracy, human displacement, and other effects of underdevelopment, another very important term, underdevelopment. Many of our nations are labeled poor, whereas they should properly be referred to as pauperized. Now, this is the official English translation. They use the term pauperized, but in the original Spanish version, I think the, the word is be much better communicated. Diaz-Canel said that the countries are empobrecidos, which means made poor. So the point he's saying is that our countries are labeled poor, but they should be referred to as being made poor. Be they were made poor through colonialism. And he said, Diaz-Canel said, we must rectify the situation in which centuries of colonial and neo-colonial dependence have left us in. It is unjust and the South can no longer bear the dead weight of all of the problems. Those who built shining cities with the resources, sweat, and blood of the nations of the South are already suffering and will go on suffering the impacts of the economic and social imbalances that favored the plunder because we're all in the same boat, although some first class and others their servants. So here he has this metaphor that the world is a ship. We're on a world ship together on the same boat, but some countries, the colonial countries, are the VIP first class. In Spanish, he said VIP. And in, in the Global South countries, the formerly colonized countries, are treated as servants on this world ship. And the Cuban president stressed that the only safe route to ensure that this world ship does not meet the same fate as the Titanic is that of cooperation, solidarity, the African philosophy of Ubuntu, which sees human progress as without exclusions, where one person's pain and hope is the pain and hope of everyone. Then later on in the speech, Diaz-Canel talked more about the technological gap, pointing out that just 10 economies, largely in the West, which spearheaded the Advanced Digital Production Technologies, ADP, account for 90% of all of the patents globally and 70% of the total exports directly related to these. Far from becoming tools for closing the development gap and helping overcome the injustices that overshadow mankind's very future, these technologies tend to be weaponized for use in widening the gap sapping the will of many of our governments and protecting the system of exploitation and plunder that for countries fed the wealth of the old colonial powers and condemned our nations to a subordinate role. That explains why, in the midst of the most tremendous scientific and technological advance of all time, the world has regressed three decades as regards reducing extreme poverty with levels of hunger not witnessed since 2005. It explains why in the so-called third world, over 84 million children are without schooling and over 660 million have no electricity, why only 36% of the population use the internet in the least advanced countries and the landlocked developing nations compared with 92% in the industrialized world. This is such an important point because we're often told by the kind of technological optimists, you know, people like Steven Pinker, these neoliberal sophists, they insist that the world is such a great place and it's only getting better with technological development. But Diaz-Canel is pointing out that technological development has resulted in some positive outcomes, certainly, 
but it has also made inequality worse, not only within countries, but with, between countries. So the inequality between the imperialist countries concentrated in the global north and the formerly colonized countries in the global south has actually been made worse, not better, with all of these new technologies. These technologies could be used to fight poverty and inequality and climate change, but instead they're used to make all those problems even worse. This is exactly why, in his speech, the Cuban president reiterated, quote, we have a duty to try to change the rules of the game. We will succeed only by mobilizing joint action. So again, this is a response, I believe, pretty clearly to the Western so-called rules-based order. We have to change the rules of the game and make them more fair. And he talks more about the issue of technology, and in particular, the policy of many poor countries to attract foreign direct investment, FDI. And he notes that this is a necessary component for our development, but foreign direct investment must be accompanied by technology transfer. But he said, quote, we know that more often than not, there is no transfer of knowledge or help with capacity building. This lack, so this is the tra English translation, there are a few issues with it, but he's saying that the lack of technology transfer with, with foreign direct investment means that the developing countries find themselves at the lowest levels in the global value chains. This is such a crucial point. And this is a point that needs to be studied much more in terms of the Chinese economic model. Because it's often said, you know, China supposedly just restored capitalism under Deng Xiaoping. No, that's not what happened at all. China still has state-owned enterprises representing around one-third of the GDP of the entire economy. The state still owns the commanding heights of the economy, including the banking sector. The four biggest banks in the world are Chinese state-owned banks. The Chinese state still owns the telecommunications grid, the transportation grid, a lot of infrastructure development, many other very important companies like oil and gas companies. So yes, there is private ownership in, in the less important parts of the economy, but the commanding heights of the economy, the most important parts, most important industries and sectors of the economy are public, they're socialized. And when, when China did allow foreign direct investment, Western capital and international capital to be invested in the country, it did so under particular conditions, not just opening and liberalizing everything with the free market and neo Western neoliberal Washington consensus policies. No, 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 no. What China did is it said that, yes, we are welcoming foreign direct investment, but under the condition that it has to be done in collaboration with local Chinese firms in order to develop China's technological capacity. And foreign direct investment was done under the condition of joint ventures, of joint partnerships with Chinese firms. And that meant that if a Western corporation wanted to exploit Chinese labor and get access to the big Chinese market, it was, it was only allowed to do so under the condition that it would transfer some of that technology so China could develop its own tech sector. And now China has made massive leaps and is now at the top of the, the value chain of technological production. It's no longer make, making low value added products, you know, toys and basic electronics. It's now making some of the most advanced technology in the world, including seven nanometer semiconductors, which the US was trying to prevent through sanctions. Huawei now with its new Mate 60 Pro has a camera that is better than the camera in the latest iPhone. I mean, so China has made a lot of these advances, not simply by just allowing foreign corporations to invest, but rather allowing investment only under the condition that technology transfer and joint ventures be done. And here in his comments, the Cuban president is emphasizing that that should be the condition. If countries in the South, poor countries allow direct foreign investment, foreign direct investment, FDI, it should be done with transfer of technology, transfer of knowledge, help with capacity building to help develop local industries as well. Furthermore, he once again talked about the issue of brain drain. This was acknowledged as well in the joint statement. He described this as the quote, 
practice of the most developed countries to poach the preparation and knowledge of professionals trained with much effort by the developing nations, generally entirely without support by the richest countries. So he's saying that the poorest countries invest all of these resources in training these officials. They don't have these experts, these doctors, these engineers. They don't have the support of the wealthy countries. And that yeah, the wealthy countries attract them through a series of policies, you know, especially migration policies in places like the U.S. and Canada, and that that prefers, that gives preferential treatment to skilled, what they call skilled labor and skilled migrants, as if, you know, people who don't have doctorates and who don't have master's degrees aren't aren't skilled. I mean, in many cases, they actually are very skilled in manual labor. But the point is that that Cuba is condemning this practice. And, and Diaz-Canel said, quote, that he said, talking about brain drain, he said, quote, this is a massive drain and a significant financial contribution by developing countries to the rich ones, much greater, by the way, than official development assistance as a result of migratory flow that is devastating for the underdeveloped world. So he's saying that compared to the so-called aid that you give us, we actually send much more value to the north, to the, the rich countries through brain drain and through this exploitation, through unequal exchange. Now, another issue, another problem that Diaz-Canel discussed was the issue of patents, intellectual property rights. He said, there is a tendency to patent everything, including life forms. And this is promoted by the World Trade Organization. So this is a, a criticism of the WTO, which has imposed these many of these neoliberal economic policies and which of course is dominated by the United States. And Diaz-Canel said, this practice of intellectual property rights is a practice that swells the coffers of large transnational corporations in the most powerful countries and makes the remaining economies more fragile. He refers to this as a privatization of knowledge, which contributes to widening the gap and limits access to development. Patents are part of a neoliberal theology. So he's saying that this is like a religion. It's not scientific, it's it's religious, it's dogmatic. Patents are part of a neoliberal theology according to which knowledge can be privatized, bought and sold like any other commodity. There is pressure on developing countries to introduce laws to protect intellectual property rights while conveniently forgetting that many industrialized countries developed precisely by pirating products and technology outside their geographic borders particularly in today's developing countries. This is such an important point. The rich imperialist countries, the colonial powers, they did not develop through a free market. I mean, as the economist, the development economist Ha Jun Chang has pointed out in books like Kicking Away the Ladder, the wealthy imperialist countries also developed their economies through protectionism and tariffs and policies to support, nationalist policies to support the development the fostering of infant industries and protecting them from foreign competition. But furthermore, Diaz-Canel is pointing out that these imperialist countries develop their economies through theft, through pillage, through plunder, through colonial exploitation. So they stole the resources and technology and exploited the labor and enslaved workers in the global south for hundreds of years. And now they're telling poor countries in the global south that were colonized by them that they can't use their technologies without paying them rent, this, this rent seeking, you know, these massive profits to these big international corporations, transnational corporations. So again, the hypocrisy is just outrageous. Now, I'm almost done with the speech here. Toward the end of his speech, Diaz-Canel talked about the issue of debt. And this is, I have a long video that I'm gonna be releasing about this soon that discusses the extreme inequalities the structural inequalities in the international financial system. But uh, Diaz-Canel, the Cuban president, referred to this as, quote, a new form of slavery. He said in 2022, 25 developing nations had to devote more than one fifth of their total income to servicing public external debt, which is tantamount to a new form of slavery. So he's saying that these poor countries in the, in the global south are being trapped in debt, not only owed to US dominated financial institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the IMF or the World Bank, but increasingly a huge part of their debt is owed to 
private bondholders, which are largely investment funds on Wall Street or in London, which invest the wealth of rich capitalists in the colonial countries, and then they buy up the cheap debt of countries in the global south and demand massive profits. They demand huge returns with very high interest rates on the euro bonds, the foreign currency denominated bonds of these countries in the global south. So they end up making billions and billions of dollars of profits. And yet the poor countries in the global south are in some cases, in many cases, they're spending more paying the interest on those debts to rich people in the global north than they spend on healthcare and education. That's why Diaz-Canel refers to this as a new form of slavery. And he also pointed out that the resources needed for a comprehensive solution to these problems, they do exist. In 2022 alone, global military spending reached $2.24 trillion. And by the way, the United States represented 40%, two-fifths of that entire global military spending. In 2022, the U.S. spent more on its military than the next 10 largest military spenders combined. And the U.S. spent 10 times more on its military than Russia and three times more than China. And the Cuban president pointed out that those trillions of dollars could be used to help fight poverty and climate change. He says, the South seems destined to live on the crumbs that the current system has reserved for it. The International Monetary Fund's financial support for the least developed countries and other low-income countries from 2020 to late November 2022 was no more than what Coca-Cola has spent on advertising its brand alone in the last eight years. It's an incredible fact. I repeat, Coca-Cola has spent more on advertising in eight years than the IMF has given in financial support to the poorest countries on the planet over three years. And furthermore, Diaz-Canel said that this international financial architecture perpetuates such disparities and forces the South to tie up financial resources and go into debt to protect itself from the instability that the system itself generates, that enlarges the pockets of the rich at the expense of the reserves of the poorest 80%. This is without a doubt an architecture that is inimical to the process of our nations. It must be demolished if we really want to work for the development of the great mass of nations gathered here. He's saying the international financial institutions, the system itself needs to be demolished, not only reformed, demolished. And Diaz-Canel concluded his speech invoking the legacy of Cuban revolutionary leader Fidel Castro. And he noted that 23 years ago, in 2000, Fidel gave a speech at a meeting of the G77, the group of 77. And Fidel famously said, this is not the time for begging from the developed countries or for submission, defeatism, or internecine divisions. This is the time to rescue back our fighting spirit, our unity and cohesion in defending our demands. 50 years ago, we were promised that one day there would no longer be a gap between developed and underdeveloped countries. We were promised bread and justice, but today we have less and less bread and more injustice. That's a beautiful, powerful note to end his speech on. Again, that was the Cuban president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, and Cuba is the president this year of the G77, and they, they held the summit in Havana of the G77 plus China. But before I conclude here, I also want to very briefly look at some of the points from Nicaragua's president, Daniel Ortega, of the Sandinista Front, who led the Sandinista Revolution in 1979 against a US-backed right-wing dictatorship, a military dictator of Somoza. In this speech, Ortega made some very powerful remarks. He noted that for 60 years, the US has tried to suffocate the Cuban people with an illegal blockade. And Ortega said, the clear objective of the empire has been to overthrow Cuba, to destroy the socialist model that is infinitely just out of solidarity with its people and the peoples of the world. Then Ortega talked about the history of U.S. colonialism in Nicaragua. And in particular, he talked about the U.S. colonialist 
William Walker, who was a mercenary colonialist known as a, known as a filibuster, and he invaded Nicaragua. And in 1856, he declared himself so-called president. Again, this is like a white North American who had nothing to do with Nicaragua. He in, he declared himself so-called president, and then he reimposed slavery, and he tried to attract the support of slave supporters in the United States in order to create colonies in Latin America. He previously tried to create a, a pro-slavery colonies in Mexico, and he f was defeated. And so and then he went to Central America, and he he tried to make himself president of Nicaragua, and he was eventually defeated, and he was executed. And uh, there was this famous Nicaraguan soldier who fought against the colonialists led by William Walker, the filibusters, and the Nicaraguan nationalist soldier is named Andres Castro, was named Andres Castro, and he was famous for, in the famous Battle of San Jacinto, he ran out of ammunition in his gun, so he simply picked up rocks, and he threw the rocks at the U.S. colonial invaders. And Ortega noted that Nicaragua is celebrating the 167th anniversary of the Battle of San Jacinto against these U.S. colonialists. And Ortega said, in a very powerful part of his speech, he said, quote, We say now and we say to that hero, Andres Castro, 167 years distant, or 167 years away, and as all of us here know, the enemy is the same, the very same, wanting to take over our peoples, our nations, wanting to impose their hegemony in the world. And earlier he said very clearly, he said that the enemy is the Yankee Empire, it's the U.S. Empire. And Ortega said, we see how they, that is the U.S. Empire, launch themselves against nations that do not have a hegemonic policy and who do not make threats, such as the People's Republic of China. How they have assailed, that is the U.S. Empire, have assailed the People's Republic of China simply because it irritates them that a nation like the People's Republic of China approaches the peoples in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, not to impose conditions, not to impose sanctions, but to contribute to the progress and well-being of our peoples. We have an ally there willing to cooperate out of solidarity. And he's specifically talking about China's president, Xi Jinping. So here we can see a, a, a very important historical anti-colonial leader, Daniel Ortega, a leader of the Sandinista revolution, a symbol of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism around the world, saying very clearly, our enemy is still the same. It is U.S. imperialism, and China has been an ally in our struggle, not imposing its own hegemony, but rather showing solidarity. And then later in his speech, Ortega drew parallels between the struggle today against U.S. colonialism, neocolonialism, and the struggle centuries ago in Latin America against Spanish colonialism, and in particular, he talks about the indigenous leader Moctezuma, who was being tortured by the Spanish colonialists. And as they were torturing him, he said, what, am I in a bed of roses? And Ortega said, we are not in a bed of roses. We are in an unequal world where capitalist hegemony is oppressing us. And he said, that is why I see here a firm, courageous, dignified position on the part of those of us who are integrated into the group of 77 plus one. And then he, he called for unity, and in particular, he called for sovereignty and opposition to foreign interference in the internal sovereign affairs of countries. And he said, we have the capabilities, our people have the capabilities, and they have the intelligence to develop, to solve all of these problems we have in humanity, like climate change. And he said, we can overcome these problems, but only if they leave us alone. So they must leave us alone. We have to tell the powers that be to leave us alone. And you will see how we are going to develop all of these problems, how we are going to make what we are enunciating here in their statement a reality. So I think, I think that's a good note to end on with countries in the global south emphasizing they're not asking for handouts. They're not asking for help. They're not asking for support from the colonialist nations of the G7 in the global north. They're asking simply to, for sovereignty, for respect, for independence, for dignity. They simply want to be able to develop independently without wars, 
and oppression and meddling and interventions and sanctions, illegal sanctions being imposed on one quarter of the global population. Those are some of the most important points being stressed in this summit that was held of the G77 plus China in Cuba. Now, as is often the case, this went much longer than I anticipated today, but I wanted to look in detail at the joint statement made at the summit and some of the speeches from the leaders who spoke. And I think it's very important. And the reason I wanted to spend so much time on it is because you're not going to see this discussed in detail in the Western media, which is much more fixated on the G20 and the G7, which we can really see are actually just a group of the Western colonial powers and their friends. Whereas the G77 plus China, which represents 134 countries, this actually is the majority of the world population, 80% of the world population. And they should get 80% of our attention in the media, but they actually get 1% of the attention in the media. Whereas the 13% of the global population represented in the West gets 99% of the attention in the media. So with that said, I'm going to conclude here. I'm Ben Norton. This is Geopolitical Economy Report. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. Please like the video. It helps to promote our material in the algorithm. And if you prefer listening to this as a podcast, all of our videos are available as a podcast version as well. And if you like the work that we do, please consider supporting us. You can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. There are several ways you can donate. The best way is you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners like you. We do not have any institutional support. We do not have any big donors, any big sponsors. We're entirely independent and grassroots. So once again, I want to thank everyone for joining me today, and I will be back very soon for more reporting and analysis on geopolitics and economics. See you next time.